Welcome to another spiritual encounter with the Upper Room Fellowship and Casper McLeod Ministries. What are we seeing happening on the world stage today? Are we truly watching the Middle East primed and ready for another major war? Could this indeed be the last Pope? And what part will the Vatican actually be playing with its team of astrophysicists through Project Lucifer? Will we witness the prophecies of Revelation 17 and 18 help bring in a one world religious system? Do we already have a one world government in place that fulfills the ancient biblical prophecies? Is America prepared for another attack on its soil? Will the UK trigger an economic collapse? Will the Nephilim, will they return or are they already living among us today? How will the transhumanist movement impact us and our children? And what will it take for a nation to repent and turn a heart back to God so he can heal and restore its people? When will full disclosure take place about the UFO manifestations? As they appear to be increasing and not going away. And how should we deal with the numerous accounts and all the witnesses who claim to have had contact with these extraterrestrials? Are they actually superior intelligent life forms from another galaxy? Or are they demonic interdimensional spiritual entities masquerading as extraterrestrials? Why do the Holy Scriptures warn us about a coming great deception. Are we truly living at the end of the age? What did the Lord Jesus mean in John 14, 12 when he said, This and greater things shall you do in his name? Does God still perform healing miracles today? If the Shroud of Turin has now proven to be genuine, is it like a receipt that Jesus left us saying, Paid in full? If God means what he said and said what he means, should we just simply obey him? When will the rapture happen? Will we in fact be the generation since Israel came back together as a nation that sees the return of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Messiah Yeshua in all his glory? Won't you join me now, your lion-hearted host, Pastor Casper of the Upper Room Fellowship and Casper McLeod Ministries as we discover together the answers and continue to love God, love all people, minister healing and miracles in the almighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah! You're listening to Spiritual Encounters with your host, Casper McLeod. And if you feel it in your heart that you'd like to support this program by making a donation or some sort of uh, g- giving, go ahead and email Pastor Casper at gmail.com. And now your host, Casper McLeod. Welcome to another edition of Spiritual Encounters. And uh, it's going to be a fantastic time tonight because I've got one of my heroes of the faith on with us. Mr. Gary Sturman's going to be with us, so getting your, your seatbelts on, get ready for that. Um, today, you know, everywhere we look, people are just filled with worry. They worry about their health, they're worrying about relationships, their businesses, their families, their friends. They worry about terrorists and corrupted governments and Illuminati and UFO, Nephilim and worldwide economic collapse. We can keep going on with this list, but you get an idea that people are pretty fearful uh, they're even worried about what's going to happen in the rapture thing. And um, we think about this, how does worry operate? How does fear operate? Because God didn't give you a spirit of fear, fear but love, power, and a sound mind. So fear is always projecting itself into your future, showing you negative and very toxic imaginations that break down the immune system. And there's only one way to you know, stop this worrying. We get into the peace of God, the supernatural peace that he wants to bless you with. It says in Romans 12, 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable, perfect will of God. We can even put on the mind of Christ. So we're going to try to do that tonight. And I want to welcome Gary Sturman. He's um, written a number of books and worked with um, the famous late J.R. Church, and they wrote some books together. And Gary's got a, a, a one that's fantastic. I encourage everybody to get this. Time Travelers of the Bible. And so I want to welcome Gary to the program tonight. Thanks, Casper. I, it's my pleasure to be here. And uh, there is much to talk about in these days. A lot of it very exciting. This is most, the most exciting time in history, possibly, that we're here for such a time as this. 
the Lord could have had us born at any time in history, and He chose to have us here for now, for this time. So let's just jump right in. And, um, in, in your book, um, you talk about a chapter on, on, on relativity of time, and you share the story about these two Welshmen, and one of them hears some, well, we'll call it celestial type music, and, and he ends up in a, some sort of circle of demonic powers, and he... And what, I was hoping maybe you could share that account with our listeners and your observations about how that plays into the modern-day UFO abduction cases. Well, there are many stories about uh, in, in the in the old world about uh, fairy circles, uh, and, and people would often in you know in Scotland, Ireland, and Europe, uh, various countries of Europe, they'd be walking about and uh, they would spot. Uh, large circles where the grass was trampled down. <clears throat> and they would say, oh, the fairies were here. They were dancing last night. And uh, and this is, is a, a big part of, of folklore in the old world. And uh, it's, the, the story to which you refer has to do with a, a gentleman who joined the fairies in one of their dancing circles. Now, uh, the warning was, never do this, <laughs> because mm. if you do, then they might take you away. <clears throat> but uh, a gentleman by the name of the Reverend Kirk, uh, many, many centuries ago, actually wrote a book in 1692 in which he described uh, fairies, and he de- de- described the dances of the fairies, and he warned Christians to stay away from these because they would be swept into an intermediate world from whence uh, uh, there was no return unless the fairies decided to return you. Well, uh, the Welshman who you're speaking of joined the circle. <clears throat> His friend went on, and noticing that he had disappeared, and uh, the gentleman uh, who had entered the fairy circle, dancing with the fairies all night, enjoying uh, imbibing in a little strong drink and some good tasting food and he came home the next morning only to discover that it was many years later and he was thought to have been dead in fact his wife remarried <laughs> mm. now this is a, is one of many 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 secret uh tales that are told in fact this book written in, in 1691 i believe by by the reverend kirk uh, it's called The Secret Commonwealth of Elves, Fawns, and Fairies. Now, we all uh, think of that as, as sort of child stories, but but in fact, in the old world, they thought of these as manifestations of demons. And, mm. and the, the fairy circles, if you entered them, there you would, be, you would enter a time uh, warp, if you will, in which time sort of ceased to flow at the normal rate. And there are many stories actually thought to be true of people having entered these circles uh, only... And thinking themselves to be there for a few hours, having emerged, discovered that many years have passed. And uh, and, in, and in fact, this merges perfectly in the 21st century with the stories of UFO circles, which I think everybody's seen pictures of uh, circles in wheat fields, you know, and so forth. Mm-hmm. And these days, instead of saying, well, the fairies were dancing, uh, they say, no, no, a UFO must have landed there. But it's the same group of people, and the Bible mm-hmm. describes them as principalities, powers, rulers of darkness in heavenly places. They are <clears throat> a lesser form, I think a lower form of demon, uh, sometimes called elves, gnomes, fairies. And there are many fairy stories, but they're all based upon the the absolute existence of the of the we people. And and uh, let me tell you, as a Christian, if I came anywhere clo- close to the we people. Uh, I would be uh, uh, <laughs> praying to my Lord to save me from that, mm. because uh, to me that's a very dark world. But, but that subject of, of time dilation, that is to say, it's an ancient idea that goes all the way back to the Greeks, that if you happen to hold hands with the fairies and the demons and the elves, you will enter a time shift. And if you do come back at all, it may be at the wrong time. Mm. This this goes back literally for thousands of years, this idea. And I've incorporated it in my book, uh, uh, Time Travelers of the Bible, just to illustrate that that time is malleable, uh, that, that not just 
Bible-believing Christians reading the Bible think of time as something uh, malleable in the hands of God, but also pagan people think of time as malleable in the hands of the fairies and the demons. And, and that's sort of, uh, that's one of the uh, the elements that enters into this whole area of reasoning. That's absolutely fascinating to, to, to realize that this goes so far back in, in the realms of history. Um, as, as we've got like this mass communication now and all this amazing technology, why do you think so many people are perishing from lack of knowledge of the Word of God? And at the same time, what, what's so drawing them into the same agenda, um, like the Hollywood, you know, E.T. type movies? Yeah, well, the E.T. movies and the sci-fi movies are, uh, I think, satisfying a part of the human spirit that, that wants to wants an answer. Humans, uh, human beings, are designed by God, I believe, to to have a hunger for the truth. And if they can't find the truth, they will search elsewhere. Uh, and on the matter of time and the fulfillment of time, uh, I think God built a a uh, yearning for knowledge uh, about time. Uh, people love to think about time. Christians, of course, uh, think about the time of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they think about prophecy in terms of time. And, of course, when I write about the time travelers of the Bible, that's that's really the heart and core of that whole subject, the, the, uh, the, way, of, the way the Bible perceives time. And, and I want to start, Casper, with a verse out of the Bible, actually two verses that I think are mm -hmm. amazing when you stop and consider what they, uh, what they mean. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, and you probably have long ago memorized these. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So here's God declaring that he created the end from the beginning. Now, what that means is that he created a timeline, and it has an end, and it has a beginning. Now, this is really a fascinating thought. Uh, science views time as sort of uh, immutable and and unknowable. That is, it, it, there was no beginning and there will be no end. But when you, with God's view of time, very interestingly, he says, I created the end from the beginning. Now, if I were to try to create time, Casper, I would start at the beginning and I would work toward the end, <laughs> being <laughs> what I am. But he works declaring the end from the beginning. In other words, he has an end result and he built a timeline to achieve the end result that he desires. And that's what this book is all about. It's about the timeline of God. Well, like in Einstein's theory of relativity, he's, he's basically, if we simplify, he's, he's saying that time and, and space converge at one point, become the same thing. So has that kind of um, harmonized with the scriptures here? Um, especially we see things like Second Peter 3a, you know, be not ignorant of this one thing. One day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Uh -huh. uh, so our, our basic understanding of time seems um, probably um, grossly understated. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> from, from the Lord's point of view, he's the master of time and space. And that timeline, which... Uh, secular man cannot see. Uh, on, uh, only those who I think are born again and, and led in the Spirit of God can perceive the timeline of God. And, and when we look at the timeline of God, we see the new heavens and the earth up there in the far, far future. And we look back to the beginning and we see in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so we have a Bible that reflects the timeline, and exactly in, and here's what I believe, and, and I've dedicated a considerable portion of my studies to this, exactly in the middle of the, the timeline is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other mm -hmm. words, that is the great marker uh, of the center of all things. And it had universal 
uh, it had universal uh, outcomes because when you read, for example, in Colossians, uh, it talks about the cross. Having made peace through the blood uh, of his cross, Paul says, by him to reconcile all things to himself, and by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So the cross was a mechanism of reconciliation, but it had more than just earthly consequences. Paul says it had heavenly consequences. Mm. That is, this wooden instrument of death reached through time, through space, into the heavens, and I am convinced that it reconciled all of the broken things of heaven and earth, uh, beginning with the fall of Satan, with Satan's rebellion. Uh, he he set every, he set himself uh, out to uh, to be like God, and in so doing, he ruined, I think, God's creation, or at least he sought to, to ruin God's creation. Uh, but that creation, which was which suffered ruin, is in the process of being repaired, if you will. And the mechanism God used was the cross of Christ, which happens to be right at the center of that timeline. The the um. Islamic people, I've read some accounts of, they, they don't see it that way at all. They think we've, we're serving a, an inferior God because he was crucified. Of course, mm-hmm. some of them don't even believe that, but I've seen accounts for the, the saying, um, you serve a, an inferior God. He was a weak you know, person that was crucified, and so now they want mm-hmm. to, to kill anyone that doesn't believe with their idolatry. Um, ideology rather so yes. how do you see that playing out right now with what's happening um we got the scoff is just like the lord said would happen in second peter 3 4 you know where's the promise of his coming since the the fathers fell asleep all things continues the same um but even then paul the apostle paul um had thought with the time then that you know any time now the lord's going to come and and fulfill the the end time prophecies but how do you see this playing out in, in the Middle East right now? Well, the fact is that, that, that in the Middle East, they, they follow the prophet, <clears throat> and, and they believe the prophet to have been in direct uh, contact with God, whom they also believe to be Allah. And uh, all I can say to you is that, that I'm a follower of the God of the Old Testament, and, and his name is not Allah, and... Uh, the God of the Old Testament uh, uh, has a son, <clears throat> and we know that. I mean, that's the centerpiece, the heart and core of our, of our faith. And the son came to be obedient to the Father. He came to earth. And, you know, this is very interesting, Casper. The idea of the son coming to earth, the son of mm-hmm. God coming to earth, uh, is, is just amazing because <clears throat> in the old days, in the days of the Greeks and the Romans and before that, the Babylonians, they always thought of God as being untouchable. Uh, the Greeks in particular said that, that God was the prime mover and that he was perfect, and because he was perfect, he would never come to earth, because to do so, he would have to touch his feet down upon planet earth, and he would get them dirty, and God would never do that. Well, our God did exactly that. <laughs> mm. He came down in human flesh, and, and he became a man and uh, suffered all the things that men do. In fact, he suffered more, I think, suffered for the sins of man. And, and in Hebrews, there's a really interesting statement that, uh, that says, and though he were a son, this is Hebrews 5.8. I mean, I'm just this is coming to my mind as we talk. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Mm-hmm. Isn't that a, an amazing statement to be made about Christ? He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Our God then condescended to suffer uh, with us and for us. And nothing, there is nothing that, that, that can possibly top that idea. Uh, the only way you can top that idea is to kill the people who believe it. Because, because that's what you have to do when when ultimate love is manifested. The only way you can stop it is to kill it, and which which is what they did to him, by the way. But but the writer to the Hebrews says he was a son, but he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, and and he was made perfect, uh, and he became the author of eternal salvation. 
that idea is so uh, uh, packed with with, uh, with uh, meaning and, mm. and with encouragement that is hard to describe. Uh, how do you describe perfect love? <laughs> it's it's impossible, and yet we through Christ we can experience that. And you put all these things together, and and you then put them on that wonderful timeline of salvation, which is by the way Genesis through Revelation, and you have in the midst of all those things you have a. a, a miraculous uh, a series of stories, you know, the story of Elijah and Elisha and the story mm-hmm. of Ezekiel and the story of Zechariah and Hosea and all of the the prophets and the apostles, and they all tell the story of time. And they all talk about the future. Uh, they all talk about the last days. And, you know, Paul said, in the last days perilous times shall come. And, uh, and, and the Bible is the only book in the world that speaks authoritatively on time travel. In in your book, you you talk a bit about parallel universes. Parallel universes. Mm-hmm. Um, could you maybe uh, extrapolate a little bit on that for our listeners? Well, it's fascinating that uh, <clears throat> time is seen as a series of events back to back it's also seen as a set of expanding rings and i talk about this uh and by the way all of this may sound arcane and difficult to understand but i've tried to write the, the book in such a way that it just kind of flows along and i'm not introducing any uh scientific ideas that are hard to understand uh and yet when you when you view uh time and immerse yourself in it, you, you suddenly realize that that there is there are various dimensions. Paul said, I knew a man once who went to the third heaven. And when he went to the third heaven, he saw things that it was not lawful for man to speak. This reminds me a lot of today's uh, scientists, uh, our, our modern physicists and mathematicians, have talked about uh, time as multidimensional. Some of them have said, well, there are as many as 13 dimensions. And I, of course, don't know what they would be, but the mathematicians have theorized about all of this. And they are, they theorize that in these different dimensions, time is perceived in different ways in each one. And, and the Bible reflects that perfectly because the, we find that when men go to heaven and then come back, it is as though somehow time were mutated. A good example is uh, is John in Revelation, who saw a door opened in heaven, Revelation 4, 1, and he was called up by a voice like a trumpet said, come, come up here, and he did. And when he did, he was immediately vaulted into the future, and it was the future even to us. In other words, the future that he was pulled into is our future. Uh, it is ahead of us yet, which is the, the, the era of the tribulation period. And, and he was escorted about by various people while he was there, angels uh, and elders uh, escorted him around and, and talked to him and said, so you see this over here? This is what this is. And see that? And, and uh, he was instructed that when he came back, he was supposed to write about these things. And so he came back, I presume through the same door, he came back to the island of Patmos and he had completed a journey of some 2,000 plus years into the future and came back 2,000 years into the past. Uh, he landed again in Patmos and he proceeded to write down the things that he had seen. And that's why, uh, that's where I got uh, the idea of, of, of time travelers of the Bible. They're, I believe they are literal time travelers. Ezekiel would be another one, uh, Elijah would certainly be a time traveler. Moses uh, is certainly a time traveler. If you if you uh, look very carefully at, at the appearance of Moses in the Old Testament, and then uh, we learn that he's going to appear again in the New Testament. And by the way, he did at the Mount of Transfiguration, where he was alive and well, standing right beside Elijah. <laughs> and Elijah was last seen in a fiery chariot. Mm. Uh, 
so so this chariot took him aloft and and we don't see him for a long long time until suddenly there he is at the mount of transfiguration and once your mind is open to these things you begin to say wow our lord is a wonderful lord <laughs> he, he can move men through time and space uh, to get things done the things that he wants to to have done the 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 mount of transfiguration does kind of harmonize with that time event horizon where we see with the um mm-hmm. the event of the resurrection which is recorded on the shroud of turin um mm-hmm. so yes I, the uh, the much has been written about that lately the uh, the idea uh, of a uh, of an event horizon the singularity a point of in a, a maximum focus of energy and of course that is exactly reflected in uh in Colossians chapter 1, where it talks about the, the cross having an effect, a transcendental effect that reaches throughout the entire universe. And, and you could call the cross, the whole event of the cross would be a, uh, an event horizon of some sort, uh, a, a focus of time space. Uh, and, and I believe very much at the center of everything. Hmm. And, you know, and as I talk like this, you know, we talk about time. Here's a fascinating thing about time. Einstein said that time did not, does not exist. And he had a, a real sense of humor. <clears throat> he, said, uh, he said, time doesn't exist. The past is gone, and it will never come back again. The future hasn't come yet. And the present is so immeasurably small that it cannot be defined. And he said, he went on to say, uh, and other physicists have said, that uh, if you divide time up, if you were to be able to divide time up into little pieces, smaller and smaller, to see how many little pieces per second you could get, you would end up at 10 to the minus 43 seconds, which is an infin- infinitesimally small length of time. Mm-hmm. And... And at that point, if you succeeded in dividing time into that small space, it would cease to exist. In fact, uh, space itself would cease to exist. Location uh, and and uh, and the the idea of of being in a particular position would cease to exist. So, uh, to to repeat Einstein, he said, "The past is gone. The future is not here yet, and the present." is infinitesimally small, and therefore time doesn't exist. Well, he said this knowing, of course, that time does exist. Mm-hmm. And, but it was his way of saying that it's, time is not what you think it is. And, uh, and I believe uh, that's a, a true statement. <clears throat> time, once you begin to cogitate on these things, uh, you'll be carried into a, an entirely different place. Well, I know from personal experience, which I wrote about in my first book, Nothing's Impossible, where I'm, my heart stopped beating in 2001, it was uh, the 3rd of July, and, and I recall still today how um, you don't lose consciousness. I, mean, I remember seeing my body fall, and, and then I had this out-of-the-body experience where um, I was at some point in, in rather a heavenly perspective where I could see everything on earth going on at one time. I was pretty extraordinary. I, I've got bits and pieces that I was able to come back intact with remembrance, and some of it just seems even too sacred to speak about. Um, things I, I couldn't even begin to articulate because there's no words to describe them, mm-hmm. which we've seen you know, in, in other accounts of people that I've talked to. That, you know, Some um, people I associated with over the years since then who have been you know, dead longer than I was. But um, all I can tell you is that the Bible is absolutely true. The Word of God, he means what he says and says what he means. So, I, it, Yes, it, it, indeed. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, it, there are things that we try to understand knowing that we never can, and yet it, it's a good exercise to try to do it. Uh, <clears throat> the... Uh, a good example of time being circular, uh, which I uh, have in in the book, I have a chapter called The Circle of Time. And 
the uh, the Jewish scholars, the ancient Jewish scholars, spoke of of circularity. <clears throat> in fact, they they spoke of circles and cycles, called in the Hebrew hakofos, uh, and we find one of those in the book of Revelation, where you have the seven churches of Asia Minor, Ephesus and Smyrna, Pergamos, uh, Thyatira, Sardis, uh, Philadelphia, and finally Laodicea, those seven churches that John wrote about. And I'm sure that you've studied the, the prophecy of those churches, how they represent uh, different eras in, in the development of the church. Right. But but they also illustrate the cycle of life of the church. That is, Ephesus is uh, holiness and uh, <clears throat> apostolic zeal at the beginning of the church, and you go to Smyrna, and the church has turned to paganism, and on to uh, Pergamos, and the church has married into the world, Thyatira, a church of idolatry. Uh, Sardis is the next of the seven, and, and it's, the, it's the dead church, which mm-hmm. is coming back to life, and then Phil- Philadelphia is the, the church that uh, called the church with, of the open door, you know, that uh, that is given the gospel, and and uh, the Philadelphian church is is thought to be the church of the uh, missionary movements and so forth. And finally, you have Laodicea, which is supposed to be the church of the end times. But the fascinating thing is that what you got there is an endless cycle, because that cycle repeats itself over and over again, starting with revival, apostolic zeal paganism turning to idolatry and then turning to to spiritual death and, and finally uh, once once again you go through the cycle of uh, reawakening revival uh, and and uh, even the cycle of uh, of, of the, the church of Laodicea which just sort of gives up and becomes part of the world and over and over and over again in the last 2000 years the church has gone through those cycles time cycles, if you will. And and so uh, the idea of time being cyclical, uh, which is very much an ancient Jewish idea, it's a biblical idea, and it's also an idea that physicists express about time. The circles and cycles of time are reflected in the Bible as well. And, and the, uh, the, the lesson to me is that, that, that God is working uh, in this way, he is allowing uh, the, these cycles of time to recur over and over and over again until everything comes together in exactly the right way, which, by the way, he has pre-planned, and, and there will be judgment, and there will be, at that time, uh, uh, a great revival, uh, the, the founding of the kingdom, and uh, and ultimately the, the recreation of the heavens and the earth in a grand cycle, you know, <laughs> God created the heavens and the earth, and he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. So uh, the whole of the universe is cyclical in nature, and surprise, surprise, physicists believe this as well. They believe that the, that the, the observable universe has gone through a series of cycles. That, that's, and it's fascinating. It, it all, it's all amazing to, to study this. And um, I mean, going back to, to Nimrod, and I, I did want to ask you about that um, while we're just jumping there. Mm-hmm. But um, you, you talk about that in your book. And um, by the way, I, I just wanted to share something you said earlier. Um, I find your, your books, especially Time Travelers of the Bible, a rather easy read. I think you, you do it. Leonardo da Vinci did. I, I loved reading about him as a boy, and he would take the most profound things and make them seem so easy that anybody could understand it. And I think you've done the same thing here. I, I start reading your book, and I, I basically can't put it down. I'm sure everybody that picks up a copy of Time Travelers will, will feel the same way. But in, in this, you were talking about Nimrod, and um, some of the research I've looked at over the years and studying this from the scriptures and everything I could find, um, I, I think the Tower of Babel wasn't so much, as Ali Mazuli um, talks about as well, wasn't so much maybe a, to- a tower in height, but rather a, some sort of power base, like maybe what we have today with the internet. Um, and I think maybe it seems it's possible that Nimrod was messing about with genetics, gene splicing and um, possibly he became like a Nephilim, which would have been the same thing that uh, the Nazis were trying to achieve, to bring back, you know, the Hercules and um, the Zeus and those kind of um, 
to mounting entities. So I was hoping maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that um, with how this, the whole Stargate and you know, the pyramids, the joints, the Atlantis, and there's this amazing suppression of history that's going on as well as um, so many churches that won't teach this stuff. So the people are walking about clueless. They're just, you know, um, it's just an amazing time to see that going on. It's great. People are getting together and, you know, attending the, mm -hmm. the, the, the churches. And, um, you know, I want to defend it any way we can. But at the same time, I, I find as well other pastors get around me and go, you know, you've got a really great message and, you know, God's using you. But if you just stop talking about that Nephilim stuff, you know, your church would really take off in great proportions. And I'm going, well, I don't want to stand before the Lord someday and say, yeah, I knew about it, but I didn't want to share it because I was afraid to. I think that we talk about uh, the old world now because we have arrived at, at the last days. I, there's little doubt in my mind that we've arrived at the last days. Uh, in Matthew 24, uh, Jesus says, as, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. I think we, we have repeated that verse so many times in the last 10 years that it's become almost passe. But what does that mean? That, that what was it like in the days of Noah? And what it was like, first of all, it was a beautiful, perfect world that God had created. It was not yet destroyed. Uh, the sin of man was, was rampant in the old world. But the old world was was marked by uh, a by perfect a meteorological perfection. You know, the uh, the rain came in in different ways than it does now. The crops grew beautifully. Uh, it was like a paradise, and this paradise was interrupted by the fall of certain angels. And mentioned several places in the Bible. Peter mentioned them. Jude mentions them. Uh, of course, there are mentions in Genesis 6, uh, the book of Enoch talks about them. And if you get into Genesis at all, you see that the giants uh, are very much a part of the old world. And who are the giants? Well, they are the Nephilim. That's just a, a Hebrew way of saying the fallen ones. And when they fell, they came for a reason. And it's very, very clear they wanted to set up dynasties for themselves on planet Earth. Uh, they saw that... that if they could break through into this dimension as physical creatures in this time-space zone, they could marry human women and they could raise up children, half-breeds, if you will, who, who would become their vassals uh, in a series of, of very large uh, ruling uh, territories. It, which happened, by the way, and this is recorded in ancient history. It, it's recorded in the Bible, uh, in in Genesis, for example. Very few people know the story, or they may have read it, read the story of the four kings who invaded Abraham's territory, and right in the middle of of the war between Abraham and the four Gentile kings. Uh, are the giants. Well, what are the giants doing there? The giants are called Rephaims, they're called Zuzims, Amims, Anakims. There are various breeds and, and societies of giants right smack in the middle of Abraham's world. Mm. What are they doing there? Well, I think that if you go back to Genesis 11, the, at the building of the Tower of Babel, and, and, and I do agree with you, by the way, about Nimrod, that he was a, uh, in some ways, a uh, genetically imperfect man. He had, uh, if you will, made a deal with the devil, which takes you back to uh, to uh, the eleventh chapter of of Genesis, where the Tower of Babel was built. Why would uh, people build a tower to try to to uh, reach to heaven and and for them to make themselves a name, as it says in Genesis eleven? What were they What were they after? Well, my contention is that. The men after the flood were trying to recreate the, the situation that existed before the flood. So they built a tower as a method, and let's just call it a, an entry point for other fallen angels who would, would come in and, and award humanity the same great prizes that the first fallen angels did. And we read about the falls of the, the, the fallen angels, the various uh, descents of the angels. You always read that 
not only did they enslave men, but they brought men great treasures from on high, so the men felt that they were being rewarded. And at the Tower of Babel, they, they wanted to repeat that experience. And, and I believe they were successful, because quickly thereafter you read about uh, the races of giants all over the place. In, mostly uh, you read about them in the land of Canaan. And, uh, and God instructs the children of Israel later on to destroy those giants in the very same way that he destroyed them the first time in the flood. God did not want the giants to populate the earth because they were uh, intruders. They were seeking to corrupt the human genome, the seed of man. Uh, and it's going to be that way in, in the latter days, just as it was in the days of Noah. Uh, and so that's, I think, why we have come to a point now where we're talking about this formerly uh, off-limits subject, you know. It's, mm. it's, you, nobody wants to talk about strange, weird things like this and fairy circles and UFOs and time time gaps and time warps and, and time-space manipulation and, and genetic manipulation and all the things that, that are beginning to enter into Christian conversation. And it, I think that's happening because we are living in the last days. I so, couldn't well, agree I, with you more. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me for rambling on no, at such I, length. How, Feel free to interrupt at any time. But uh, I was going to ask you how how do you think um, after the flood and 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 everything was perfect again? How do you think this came back in? I mean, with Noah's um, son, um, why why did he curse him? He cursed his grandson, actually. Um, what was going on with that? I mean, when you look at some of the rabbinical writings, they indicated there was some sort of sexual perversion that possibly happened at that moment. And how did how would that have come in? Yeah. I mean, because this is all well, by thoughts. I mean, how did the enemy come back in so quickly? The enemy, first of all, the enemy was invited. Uh, but I think the Tower of Babel was was an invitation because in, in Genesis uh, eleven. Uh, it it says and they the people said let let us build a, a a city and a tower whose top may reach to heaven and let us make a name. In other words, they wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to connect themselves with uh, the, the names of power and authority, if you will, the demigods that came down from heaven and and, uh, and brought power and brought brought uh, prestige and brought technology, if you will, and brought. Uh, riches, mm -hmm. methods of, of mining and refining and building great buildings and so forth. And, and they still remembered what it was like before the flood, and they wanted to repeat it again. They wanted to, to repeat that experience, which I think in part they did. Uh, and there was a period, a post-flood period, when the giants once again populated the earth. And, and today, so we've got um, as we talked about earlier, we've got these massive amounts of, um, well, you know, I mean, there's secular guys as well as Christians, you know, dealing with people that claim to be abducted now. Um, and you're tying the back in. I mean, they, it's the same demonic entities, re, you know, reappearing over and over again in different um, cultures, in different formats. And, and you indicate in your book, like, um, the fairies were taking kidnapping people just like the abductions today there uh, yes. there was a hybrid children being produced just like we're reading about today um, mm -hmm. maybe you can elaborate a bit on that for our listeners yeah in the old country and you've probably heard the term changeling you know in in the old country in Ireland in particular they talked about changeling babies where you know a, a newborn baby would be uh, swapped for a fairy child <clears throat> who would look almost exactly like the original baby and the fairy child would grow up but he wasn't pure human he would be an enchanted child and the the, the fairies that is the the demons would be able to use him to do their will in various ways uh, and and th this was a if you will a prominent myth in the uh, societies of the old world that that these fairies would uh, would create changeling babies and, of course, we laughed at that. I mean, people commonly heard these old myths and laughed at them. But, in fact, uh, there seems to be, in retrospect, a lot of truth. And 
and the the concept of the changeling moves right into the 21st century uh, with UFO abductions, uh, in which uh, the fetuses of women are stolen and uh, and tampered with, and, re- and oftentimes returned as uh, genetically modified human appearing children. And no less a man than David Jacobs, who is a a, a Ph.D., a tenured professor at Temple University, has written a couple of books that that talk about his belief that that these transfers and genetic modifications of human beings are being accomplished on a daily basis, and uh, the demonic races are replacing uh, humans with facsimiles or copies of themselves who at a given time in the future will rise up and function as leaders, if you will, in the human community. And and all of which sounds totally uh, insane unless you study uh, for a long time and and come to a conclusion that something dark and evil is going on indeed, uh, fomented, I think, by what we call UFOs, uh, which are simply... Uh, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness in, in, in high places. And, you know, their leader is Satan, who is called the prince of the power of the air. Uh, and I think that, that Satan and his minions fly around all over the place, and occasionally they are, they are spotted. Uh, their little chariots of fire are spotted as they're going about their evil work. Uh, and I don't think there's any doubt about that. You indicated in your book um, about this is going on the same way in the Middle Ages and, and gave an example with Martin Luther's um, table talk where there was a passage where Luther um, basically says there's a local man that he felt was a, a changeling. Uh, he didn't mm-hmm. think he was completely human. So this is certainly a long-term um, process that's been happening. And of yes. course, people say that, oh, that's just conspiracy theory, Gary. Well, we know when somebody says that, then they must be psychic because they know all the information without doing any research and looking at the data. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, it's in the, in the book I have called these people transdimensional raiders. Uh, and you know, that's what they are. Uh, there, there has been, uh, a long debate literally since and it's fascinating that it really started in 1947 and I have documented this over a long period of time in 1947 of course in July there was the Roswell event in which a ship crashed in Roswell and you know there was a huge military cover up and they took all the parts and pieces and the bodies of the aliens uh, back supposedly to uh, an air base back east where they hid these things and then began to research uh, them. And there was even the rumor that, that a few of the little creatures that were in the this crashed UFO were still alive and they lived long enough to, uh, to, to give away a few of their secrets. Well, uh, what do you say about that? You say, well, that's crazy. I don't believe it. And yet, more and more and more government information has been leaked, uh, even to the point that, that we now know that uh, in 1953, in, in the, the Eisenhower administration, there was a, a funded project called Project Jehovah, which included great names like uh, uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer and Edward Teller and Albert Einstein, who were in Project Jehovah, and their task was to try to make some success or some sense out of, of of these crashed UFOs, and it's fascinating to me that they named their project Project Jehovah. They actually mm-hmm. named named their project after the Lord, which means that they must have thought that somehow God was involved in all this. Uh, Eisenhower himself was a Christian. He was raised a Christian in Kansas, uh, and, and people who knew him said he was a devout Christian. And he was at the head of this project called Project Jehovah. And many people have said since then that Project Jehovah was the first of many similar projects in which uh, conversations uh, and uh, and transactions were held w- between humans and aliens in which we received a lot of alien technology, which helped our military effort. Well, this reminds me of what... Uh, was written about in the book of Enoch when Enoch said that the fallen angels came and brought man gifts from heaven, all kinds of 
technology. Uh, they, they taught men how to smelt metals and how to make chemical compounds and all sorts of things. And uh, in my opinion, nothing has changed. It's the same story, uh, 21st century version. Well, you're right. It seems like the technology advanced tremendously. That's when the transistor radio came in about that time yeah. as well, isn't it? So um, lots of implications there. What, what a, yeah, it's, but, it's, a, it's just, to me, um, as strange as it sounds, uh, it's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. It, and I guess it, the argument would could be settled very easily among Christians uh, on the basis of what do you think the world was like before the flood? And most Christians have been taught that before the flood, it was uh, that it was sort of kind of nice and peaceful, and uh, people were marrying and giving in marriage and growing their crops and and multiplying on the face of the earth, and then nothing really bad was happening. But then you begin to look at it, and and God had to destroy the planet. Why? Because something horrible had happened, and, and only eight people were saved. And they were saved, I believe, because they were genetically pure. They had not been corrupted by the fallen ones, and whereas the rest of humanity had been. What this means, if you if you just take the plain and simple meaning, is that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man, that man will be genetically corrupted in the last days, as he was in the days before the flood. And how is that happening? Well, it's we are now doing genetic modification on human beings uh, in laboratories everywhere. And uh, I'm sure, Casper, uh, you've read about uh, genetic modification of super soldiers and super right. intellects and so forth. And so, you know, let's face it, I think we're in days of Noah number two. Yeah, I, I think um, what's disturbing in that too is, is um, I mean, I've, I've seen with Certain states in America have actually have laws now where you can't sell a hybrid. Well, why would they have laws about that unless somebody was actually selling hybrids, um, half human, half animal? You know, in, in England, in some of the laboratories, there was at least 150 uh, produced. And, you know, the, the excuse being that the pharmaceuticals could bypass a lot of the testing because if, it, if it's a half pig, half person or something like mm-hmm. that, um, just like they're having ligers and zorses and you know, different mm-hmm. com- combinations of animals that, which we thought couldn't produce like a, you know, like a, a horse and, and donkey get together and produce a mule, but apparently some right. of them can actually produce now. So very strange time with that. Um, very strange indeed. And so I think we're kind of nearing the end of the program. Um, before we run out of time, I would like to ask you to just encourage everyone listening um, because I think as I heard you say s- several times I, I thought it was absolutely brilliant um, several of the meetings I was with you this past year and you talked about why was there even a rapture because it was certainly not because God's waiting for the last Christian to get saved because there will be plenty of Christians saved after the rapture but maybe you can um, take us out with um, some of your final thoughts here and how we can best encourage people and, and so they can take that and encourage the, their friends and families and neighbors to get right with the Lord. Well, you know, it, it, that's an interesting question. Why do I believe in the rapture? And, and I want to begin uh, in, in John. And, and this is fascinating to me, but it's more, more than fascinating. This is very personal. Uh, in John 17, uh, when Christ prayed before his crucifixion, he prayed an interesting prayer. He prayed uh, for himself and for his disciples, but he also prayed for anyone who would ever be a believer in the future. And and what he prayed is interesting. He's, and starting in, the, in John seventeen twenty three, he prayed, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. And then he said, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. 
Well, you put that all together, and he's praying, uh, I in them and thou in me. In other words, that that the Father and the Son and all future believers will be joined together. And Paul r- later writes about this, and he says, we are the body of Christ. We are inseparable from him. Now, if, that, if you've never thought about that before, it seems impossible. But the more you study the Bible, the more you learn that we who are saved are part of the body of Christ. We are inseparable from him. And because of that, and because he is the judge of all things on planet Earth, John 5.22 says, The Father hath commended all judgment unto the Son, meaning the Father is not the judge of this world, the Son is. And if you put that all together, it means that one day the Son is going to judge the world, but we are part of him. We are his body. Now, if, he's going to, if, if that is true, then we are going to be with him as he does the judging, if you see what I mean. Since we are part and parcel of him, we are inseparable from him, we are part of the body of judgment. Therefore, how in the world could we be the judged in the tribulation? We could not be. It's impossible. And therefore, we must uh, somehow be taken out of the field of judgment before it happens. And, and to me, that is the basis. And that's, that's the first step in understanding the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. That's absolutely a brilliant explanation, and I, I pray everyone received that with the love that it was sent. <laughs> so um, yeah. you've, you've got you've got um, a new um, network being launched with Prophecy Watchers, and maybe we should share a little bit about that and how people can best get your books and well, materials. Well, we, uh, we have a, a website, and uh, uh, our website is called Prophecy Watchers. <clears throat> and it's prophecywatchers.com. And if you go to that website, uh, you can find uh, an online bookstore. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, uh, and, th- and that would be facebook.com forward slash prophecywatchers. And, uh, but the, the thing I would encourage people to do is to, is to go to our website, prophecywatchers.com, go to the bookstore, and uh, you can just go right down and, and uh, see all the books we offer, including Time Travels of the Bible. And we have a system uh, whereby if you order, uh, you'll receive the things you order very quickly. We are uh, very much interested in getting uh, people the information that they seek as quickly as possible. You can sign up for an email uh, uh, newsletter. You can uh, uh, so we have a contact log, we have a television log, uh, and very soon we're going to be going on television with Prophecy Watchers. Uh, but we haven't quite done that yet, but it's going to happen in the very, very near future. Right now we're just on the web at prophecywatchers.com. And we have a number, by the way, a number of videos on Prophecy Watchers. You can uh, view uh, uh, conversations that I've had with a, with a number of different people. Uh, Bill Salas, uh, L.A. Marzulli, others uh, have, uh, men of God, uh, have uh, come and spoken with us, and, and we have those conversations on video right there at prophecywatchers.com. And I uh, would love to have people visit us. Well, I encourage everybody to do that. This has been absolutely fantastic, and I look forward to having you on in the future again, do another spiritual encounter with us. And. Um, well, I'd love to. I'd love to. It's, uh, you know, the, 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 here's the thing, Casper, and, and this is what I, the, this is my burden. It's my burden as a, I, I too am a pastor, uh, and my burden, not only in my congregation, but in people I talk to about the Lord, is to convey His love to other people. Uh, and I think that's sort of been lost in our era. Love has been trampled upon in the 20th and 21st centuries. It's been perverted. Uh, it's been cheapened. Uh, but if you can transmit the love of God convincingly to other people, then they, they will flock uh, to, to be close to the Lord Jesus Christ, if, you, if we can adequately describe what he did. Well, I believe you're doing that very thing. So um, I think Rick's going to take us out with a song that you helped inspired called Keep Looking Up. Ah, 
Very because I love the, way, love the way you keep saying that. Keep looking up, friends. We'll see you next Indeed. time for another adventure on spiritual encounters. And please check out Prophecy Watchers and all the books Gary's got available on DVDs. You'll be blessed. Good night, everyone. Stay tuned for L.A. Marzulli.